welcome everyone to Liquid Margins. Um, this is called Back to School, Engaging Faculty with Annotation. And this is our sixth Liquid Margins. So um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, right now I'd like to introduce today's guests. We have Betsy Berry. Um, she's the Executive Director of the Center for Advance for the Advancement of Teaching at Wake Forest University. And Christine Moskell, she's an instructional designer from Colgate University. And Jeremy Dean, he's our VP of Education at Hypothesis. He's gonna be our moderator today. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the guests and let you say something about yourself or just say hello, whatever you'd like. So hi, I'm Betsy. Um, really happy to be here. Um, I'm, as uh, Franny said, you know, I'm the executive director of the teaching center at Wake Forest, um, but I also teach. Uh, my background is in philosophy and religious studies. And so I, I've used hypothesis in my own courses, as well as working with faculty here at Wake Forest to think about integrating hypothesis into their classes. And I'm Christine Moskell. I'm an instructional designer um, for connected learning, actually. That's my focus here at Colgate. I work in what's called our Learning and Applied Innovation Group in ITS, but we also work very closely with our Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, I actually do not have a background in instructional design. I have a PhD in natural resource management and found, I had taught as an adjunct at Colgate and then found my way to instructional design as a, as a different way to support teaching and learning here at Colgate. Um, so I've been supporting Hypothesis for a few years now and I wish I had known about it when I was teaching because I definitely would have used it. But it's exciting to support other people who are using it in their courses. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, are you on? Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeremy Dean, Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. Uh, I've been working in collaborative annotation for about eight or nine years, uh, two different companies. And before that, uh, I, was a, I got a PhD in English at UT. So I'm also a, uh, well, I'm a lapsed academic, a rogue academic. Uh, <clears throat> I'm excited to, uh, talk to you guys today about what it's like to go back to school uh, right now. Um, it kind of feels like it has a whole different meaning um, in this day and age. Uh, so my first question uh, to the panelists is uh, a, a pretty complicated uh, one, and I mean it, you know, genuinely, but uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Christine, how are you doing right now uh, with all that's going on? Uh, yeah. Especially in higher ed. Yeah, surprisingly very well. But um, I don't know, it's this weird situation where Colgate is fully reopening. We're a small school of 3000 students and they're expecting 2800 of them to return in less than two weeks. So I guess I sort of feel like I'm riding on a bus that's driving off a cliff and depending on how injured I get will depend on like all these other factors in play. So that's kind of how I feel. But Right now, I'm like enjoying the ride before we get to the cliff. That's how I'm feeling. <laughs> but I, I kind of feel like there is going to be a cliff, you know, and I don't know how deep, how, how big the fall is going to be yet. Mm. Yeah. Let's see, what's your metaphor for how you're feeling? <laughs> I, I know. I like to use my, my friend Josh Eiler's metaphor of uh, how in, in Indiana Jones, where, you know, in many scenes where there's one thing that he escapes and then the next thing all of a sudden comes up and now he has another thing he has to do. And that I feel like since March, um, you know, no, number of things have come up, we've resolved that. And then it's like now time for the next thing. We've even started talking about spring at Wake Forest as well, um, just to start planning. And it's just, it's a kind of ceaseless amount of work. And I will say one good thing um, about Wake Forest is Wake Forest really cares about teaching uh, and thinking about teaching. So I have been very heavily involved in the university planning for what we're doing um, at the at high levels, um, which has been a ton of work. And, a ton, and all of you at all of your institutions know how much work your administrators are putting into this and, and getting faculty engaged as well. And so I'm tired, um, but I also think the things that we have been able to do at Wake, there have been moments of inspiration that sort of keep me going. Um, but I definitely, since it's we're entering month six now, essentially, of just nonstop work, I think a lot of us are just feeling like we need, we normally have summers to take a little bit of a break and regroup and strategically plan and we didn't have that. Um, so 
So I think, yeah, I don't know, a good metaphor for just being tired and exhausted, but we're a week away from the students coming back and all the different modalities and, and supporting faculty with that. But uh, I think they're ready. I do think, they may not think they're ready, but I definitely think our faculty are ready. So, um, so I'm, I'm a little anxious and hopeful and also just hoping I can, you know, take one week off someday soon. <laughs> maybe, maybe yeah. next summer, I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> Uh, what what is the plan at, at Wake? Uh, Christine said most kids, are, most students are coming back. Yeah, so we have um, so there just like many schools, sort of there's a discussion of the academic plan, and then there's also the residential plan. And so um, we invited all students back residentially, um, and not all are coming back. But we also have flipped our singles versus um, doubles, and also preserved a number of rooms for quarantine and isolation. So we also um, uh, rented out other apartment complexes in Winston-Salem so that students could have singles. So a number of students are coming back, but, but in a de-densified campus. And then our classes, uh, over 50% of them are fully online. Uh, about 10 to 12% are fully in person. So like labs and studio art, et cetera. And then there are some that we're doing blended, but we're not doing high flex. We're doing blended where there's, uh, you know, they may meet once every so often in person, but the rest is fully online. So those are our, our three broad modalities. And most of the seats, because our big classes are fully online, are actually online in terms of our coursework. And so that's a huge, that's still a huge increase of, in terms of remote teaching and learning for the students there or? Uh, compared to normal? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, Wake Forest has um, traditionally only had online courses in the summer and usually like 10 courses. So 10 courses a year online typically. And now it's most of the courses are online. So both our faculty and, and we actually surveyed our faculty. And I, I think we found that 10% of our faculty had taught online before the spring. And that includes at other institutions. So we had to go from zero to you know, and so it was a big, a big ask of our faculty, but they're amazing. And they, they put in the work this summer to learn and to think, but yeah. most of our faculty and students had never experienced remote learning or online education. All right. So look, from afar, it looks like you guys have been doing a great job there. Christine, are, are, are students going to be in face-to-face -face courses or are people going to be there residentially, but taking a lot of courses uh, remotely? My sense is that the majority of faculty are teaching in person. Um, they're going to try to. Um, I want to say like it was like about a third of faculty though said that they would teach fully remotely. Um, and online learning here is brand new. Colgate, we're a small residential liberal arts college where the face-to-face -face interactions and teaching is very sacred and I think we have like one edX course that's taught every year and that's it. So this is all new. But so I want to say that face-to-face, -face, preserving that face-to-face -face element Socially distanced, of course, I think Colgate's working really hard to make it happen. Although I went to campus today just on a bike ride with my daughter and there are tents being set up all outside. So there's gonna be a lot of outdoor classrooms set up here. Interesting, interesting. Um, when you guys were talking about metaphors, I was, uh, in my mind, I had that uh, Simpsons uh, image of like, I think Sideshow Bob is like walking and he like steps on a rake and he's like, oh, and he's like, walks and he steps on another rake and he just keeps, it's like a field of rakes. Um, I know that's not as glamorous as, uh, as Indiana Jones, <laughs> but same idea. Um, so uh, tell me what it's like to talk about, and we'll get there to, uh, to talk about annotation specifically, but what's it like to talk to instructors about technology <laughs> right now, uh, just generally, uh, and introducing new technologies and helping instructors that may not really have uh, utilize a lot of technologies, maybe even not the LMS, like just generally, what's it like to talk about technology with, with instructors? And Betsy, maybe you can start us off. Yeah, I think um, one thing I've been noticing and we've been talking about here at Wake is the difference between talking with them right now about it versus talking with them two months ago. And that right now, I think they're in a sort of panic of, I just got to get this planned and put together. And so no new, no new information, please. And that's smart, I actually think on their part. But I would say that um, earlier this summer, it, they were really eager to learn, it, particularly if we could connect it to what uh, Christine was saying about how this tool is actually going to help you preserve that thing that you love so much about in-person teaching, but that you had trouble with in the spring um, because we just stuck to the things that were just quick and easy. And so um, many of them got very excited about that. And so it's really a framing, as you all know, those of you that introduced technology, framing it as, and we, I have a wonderful 
you know, we have a wonderful team of colleagues that I work with at Wake Forest who did the same that you've talked to before, I know. And um, so helping them think through these as not uh, um, uh, obstacles, but actually reinforcing the thing that they want to do uh, was, was wonderful. And helping them think about how you might be able to bring this back to your in-person classes after this moment got them really excited too, because they didn't think it was wasted effort to learn the tool. That's great. Christine, what about you? I just, I think it's a lot different than in the spring because I feel like the spring kind of had this element of this is crisis mode. We're going through a lot of trauma right now. So I feel like that still sort of is lingering in the air, but people I think saw this coming. So that, that has made it a little bit easier. Of, like people realize like we're stuck in this together, like let's figure it out. And I just have to say in working with faculty, I just have so much empathy for them. And it's really hard to, to be empathetic when they're freaking out about something not working. But there just have been so many, for me personally, um, when sometimes when I interact with faculty, they almost feel like they like will make self deprecating comments like I'm I don't know technology at all. And I'm like, well, you figured out how to get into the zoom meeting with me. <laughs> you know, so so trying to like boost their confidence, like you might not feel like you're technologically savvy, but you're learning. I'm here to help you. Let's take this slow. We'll figure it out. So I guess that's kind of been the framing for me for how I'm approaching faculty is just having a ton of empathy for them because I can only imagine that the pressure is really high on multiple level levels. So yeah, absolutely. And so Christine, right back at you, like mm -hmm. what is the role of, uh, of annotation, collaborative annotation or social reading in the sort of set of tools and practices um, that you are working with instructors to, um, to take on at this moment? Mm -hmm. I've really been framing the use of annotation and hypothesis as a way to build community with your students. Um, because, you know, especially for courses that are meeting like asynchronously, um, students might not have that synchronous real time interaction. So hypothesis the MART creates, can, opens up a community, if you will, or a space for community to develop in the margins of a text, which I just think is really powerful. And I think is something that instructors, I've, I've had good luck, I think, piquing people's interest in the tool by framing it in that way. Because when we're not meeting, it just, like, we need more social connection in this day and age. So I think that's a real, that's been a really powerful message to me. Of course, there's the deep, it, it helps with deep reading. It helps students see, like make their thinking visible to their peers and see the instructor. Like that's all important too, but that hasn't really been what I've led with. I've led with, this is another tool to create community, um, a scholarly community, if you will, among your students. Interesting. So that's what I it like is, that. has been for me. Yeah, I love that. Uh qualify over the scholarly community and sort of training mm -hmm. students to think about themselves as a, as a scholarly community. Betsy, what about you? How have you been talking about collaborative annotation with uh, instructors there at, at Wake? Yeah, I think that uh, helping them see this as a place where you can build community is certainly a part of, of our conversations. Again, um, many of our courses uh, at Wake Forest are discussion-based, not all of them, but many of them are sort of traditional liberal arts experience. And so helping them see that there are tools that can allow that to persist outside of the classroom is really important. And I think it's also kind of a, um, a wonderful uh, alternative for the faculty who are like, oh, I really don't want to do a discussion board <laughs> to say that here are things, here are ways that you can have discussions that are actually pegged to the text in a way that's really powerful. Um, and I also think because so many of our faculty, I mean, we were having slow, but some uptake even before March of hypothesis because so many of our faculty, myself included, care so much about reading and texts. Um, we're a very humanities heavy institution. And so this was a, just immediately clear to them when you just show them, and that's the key, hopefully we can talk about that too, is when you show them how it works instead of just explaining it to them um, and actually having them do it, you know, practice it, I think made them realize almost immediately, oh, I see how this can be helpful in my course. Um, and so we've had a lot of people interested in using it. That's great. Why don't you pick up where you suggested going next by saying like, you know, what are their sort of techniques of, of, of introducing it? You mentioned hands-on and, and showing yeah. them, like talk about. Um, and we didn't, some schools also hired just a bunch of instructional designers, contract ones, and we didn't want to do that. So we created a, um, 
I don't like this language, but train the trainer model is a quick way to explain it, that basically we worked with 66 peer uh, faculty leaders um, and we had a learning community with them where we, we taught them things. And then they went out and had groups of 15 faculty in their departments and they had learning communities that they ran for them. So it was a sort of scaled way to get to everyone. And I think what was really important about that model back to this question of showing faculty is that we actually ran it like an online course for two weeks. Mm. And it was really important to do that so, that so that the faculty got to experience what it was like to be a student in an online course. And so we used Hypothesis just because I love it and think it's easy. And they loved it. Like using it to just talk with one another, reading pedagogy articles and thinking about teaching and learning. And then we didn't require them to do this in their learning communities, but most of them adopted hypothesis for their learning communities. And so then all the faculty got to see how it worked there. And so now so many faculty are adopting it for their courses, just because we did this kind of distributed model of we're going to have enroll you in a course where you actually are a student using hypothesis, and then mm -hmm. you're going to enroll your colleagues in a course where they uh, use hypothesis. So it worked out really well. It was not an intentional plan to yeah. seed hypothesis, but it has really worked, worked really well for us. That's really cool. I just love the idea that, that a tool is useful to an instructor as part of their professional work, not just in terms of uh, their you know, teaching part of that, or it's also part of their scholarly work as well. Um, yeah, I, I love that. Uh, very cool. Uh, Christine, how have you guys been introducing, you know, in a more practical way, uh, faculty to hypothesis mm -hmm. or to annotation? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll also give a little bit of context about just introducing all tools to Colgate at all tools to Colgate faculty, and then I'll position hypothesis there. But we're we're kind of taking like a we're just presenting a menu of things for faculty to refer to, and we kind of they like create their own learning pathway. I wouldn't formally call it that, but that's sort of been like we're just gonna put a whole bunch of different support on the table, and you pick and choose what you have the bandwidth to do. So I've been offering workshops on hypothesis all summer long. Um, like two a week actually for most of the summertime. Um, and, and again, we have 300 faculty here at Colgate. So if I get five people, that seems like a lot. Um, so in my workshops, um, I definitely start off with a discussion of just reading in your courses. And I always ask um, faculty like, go back to the spring and w did you notice any change in your students' engagement with the reading before and after the pivot to online learning? And I have definitely had a spectrum to like, students' readings went up, engagement with readings went up because they had nothing better to do, to like, I have no idea what was going on with students because there was just so much trauma in my class that like, whether they did the reading or not didn't matter. So I just had the whole spectrum of answers, but that's meant to really, um, start us off in a discussion and reflection of what's the role of readings in our course. And now that we're mostly like online or in this hybrid mode, how do we, how can we know that students are engaged in the readings that we give them? So then I'm like, oh, well, here's this tool hypothesis that, and I do, I actually have not this book, but I have a book that's been heavily annotated, like from grad school that I show up and I talk about, I show a picture of a Colgate classroom where the students are sitting really close. They have their readings out. And I'm like, because many faculty expect that students bring the printed readings or the books to class. And I'm like, you can't see what students wrote in the margins of the text. So I actually, on Zoom, I like show, hold the book up. Um, and so just meant to like frame up, like this is the learning environment that we find ourselves in. And then I introduce hypothesis. I, I talk, I spend time talking about kind of the pedagogy of web-based collaboration and what the affordances are of a tool like hypothesis. So I mentioned link. Um, like making student thinking visible is one, one segue, I guess I give to introduce showing them the tool. And then also this um, Philip Candy's idea of linking thinking, the idea that um, within the margins of a text or, or um, something you can't do in a hard copy text is provide a hyperlink to another article on the web. So I talk about linking thinking as something that another affordance of web-based annotation is students can be linking to other articles and resources on the web. And that, that also gives them a new way to demonstrate their, that they're making connections between what they're reading and other resources out there, like connected learning, right? So I, I kind of tell that story. And then I introduce hypothesis by just showing example pages online that have been annotated. So I refer to the marginal syllabus. I don't know if people, 
they work closely with Hypothesis. Um, but it's a teacher professional development program where educators use Hypothesis to annotate articles about equity in education. So I just use um, use the mar a few readings from the marginal syllabus project just to give people like the 10,000 foot view of this is what the tool looks like. Here's what here's an annotated page. And then I kind of pivot into here's some instructional uses of the tool, continuing to show example um, web pages that have been annotated as part of assignments in higher ed. So that's kind of the arc of the story that I tell in my workshops, but that the workshops again have been the primary way that I've been engaging faculty with hypothesis. That's awesome. I'd like to sit in on one of those. Um, and I'm definitely going to steal I'll that linking. You, send you the Zoom link. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely, and I like, I'm going to steal that linking thinking idea. That's really cool. Um, Christine, I want to stick with you just for a second um, and ask, are there any particular disciplines where you see this uh, tool getting, uh, annotation getting picked up more than others or particular types of courses? Um, I would say it's been pretty evenly distributed. I have um, Allison Colazar is a friend of mine. She was on, she's in geology here at Colgate. She was on liquid margins a few weeks ago. And also um, um, Jennifer Blake Mahmood, she's a postdoc in um, biology here at Colgate. So th they're kind of our science um, annotators, if you will. But I've also had um, faculty who heavily use hypothesis in um, Spanish, having students annotate, actually annotate in Spanish. Um, history, um, geo uh, I said geology, but also geography. So I guess I've had, we're an interdisciplinary liberal arts college, so you, it makes sense that there's a distribution across all the disciplines, but I really have, I, I would not say that one discipline has had a higher rate of adoption than another. It's been pretty right. even here. You didn't even mention English, which is the obvious one, but uh, so yeah, that's great that uh, it's such a wide uh, inter uh, disciplinary um, Span there. What what about you, Betsy? And and also just the question about what what types of courses, in addition to what disciplines, if there are a lot of smaller courses or some of the bigger courses are using it as well. Yeah, uh, and I, and I don't have as as much of my finger on the pulse of this as much as Kyle, and I know he's here, so he can chat about this too. But I I definitely think before pandemic. Uh, we were targeting humanities. Just it made a lot of sense that that they were so. Uh, um, interested in text and also some in some ways doing less technology in their courses so it made some good sense to start here but i think actually because of our peer learning communities being across the board i know for a fact just off of the top of my head that there are folks in all the disciplines and all the major divisions of the university that are thinking about ways they can use it i think they'll use it somewhat differently which you would expect in different disciplines but um but i i do see that that um that I was, I was intrigued and incited that many folks in disciplines that were not text, that were not humanities based, were just as excited and saw the, the, the value of it as well. Um, and that most of our faculty assign texts, you know, even if it's in a science class, they assigned a textbook. So, um, so it seemed to work well for them. What about pushback? Have you had any resistance to uh, hypothesis or collaborative annotation. <laughs> I see Christine is already unmuted. She's ready for that question. We can go to you, Christine, and give give Betsy a second. Um, so I had an interesting interaction with a faculty member during one of my workshops where I just have to frame this as I think it was stemming from just this larger place of almost trauma. Like the the way that I have taught like I didn't sign up to do this online anything. And here I am stuck with this. So, so I just wanna, again, my empathy hat is on. Um, but during my workshop, they just started making comments about how unfortunate it is that students are reading texts online now. And that they were very much, I think they were in um, language, like a, like a romance language, um, our, our department of romance languages here at Colgate. So I think re the actual physical act of reading a hard copy of a text was a sacred practice to them as a person and to their discipline. So it was one of these, like in the middle of my workshop, luckily I didn't have too many people and I was able to engage in this discussion, but um, the pushback was more related to just like, what does it mean to be a reader online? 
That's so, I, I love that um, you use the language of sacred practice, uh, especially as a religious studies and philosophy scholar. Cause, and I will tell you that I actually do see read like behind me, like hard copy books are, I would frame it for myself as being a sacred practice. Like in all the ways, all the baggage that comes with that phrase, uh, what we mean by that. Um, and so I actually think, uh, but it's also there are other sacred practices in these in humanities disciplines too that are tied to discussing ideas and texts and so i think saying yeah that's great but there's other things you can do one of the conversations I, or struggles i had when i first started using this and talking with other faculty was i wanted my students to read hard copies again not necessarily rationally so <laughs> this is related to being a sacred practice but i loved the discussion so much that i was like well that outweighs the value of that in this case and so i i even told some students to buy the book as well <laughs> so use this and like have the use this for the discussion but buy the book because you will have it in your library and that's really important to me and of course they probably rolled their eyes at me like i'm, I'm not stuck in you know i'm still still in my old school ways but um but i do think uh reminding them of the other side of the benefits can could be helpful there but I, I totally am not surprised when you said that I haven't experienced that but I'm not surprised that you had some faculty who were just very sad at the loss grieving the loss of the hard copy book <laughs> that's what I and I, I also think that they they also expressed this sense of we're all zoomed out and like our, we're just like glued to our computers all the time and I, like so I think they were struggling with like I don't want to be complicit and having my giving my students more screen time to do this reading um so yeah I, that's really interesting yeah yeah so that that jeremy i hope that provides an answer to your question around pushback it does and i, and I would just add that you know like i too i don't have such a lovely bookshelf as as you do back there betsy but uh I also, you know, consider books sacred. Um, if, if I was still in the classroom, I wouldn't want students to be buying the books. I think um, it's hard to, to quantify it, which maybe is just fine, but I want my kids, students get lost in the book in some physical way, like go get, forget time underneath a tree on campus or something like that as you get lost in the book. Um, but in terms of sacred practices, uh, you know, there, you know, what, there can't be an either or, right? It's not like, you know, texts are online, right? And it's not just the books themselves, they're physical books that are sacred, right? There are a lot of practices that surround the books. And it's true that when books move online, a lot of those practices become harder, like annotation. And it's, uh, and so I guess, uh, I'm just thinking that, you know, you need to preserve some of the analog sacred skills in the new environment. And that's, that's one way to think about this is that the books are going there, you know, and your students are reading online. You're not, you're not going to be able to fight against that, especially not now, maybe, right? Um, and so why not focus on some of the sort of corollary aspects of what we consider to be our suite of sacred practices in academia um, and try to make some of those as authentic um, and vigorous as they can be uh, online as we, as we move into these new uh, era, you know. Um, this is great. Uh, I want to pause here and, and see with Franny uh, or Nate. Actually, I'll first I'll turn it to you, uh, Betsy and Christine. Just see, is there anything that you wanted to share as you were thinking about this conversation this morning that I haven't been able to elicit um, in in my questions? Um, and then that you or or. Uh, or I, I, yeah. I mean, I can say more, but I think I'm going to wait for the, I'll just, let's see if the, I'm sure the questions will raise the things that I will add. And if it doesn't come up, I'll say something before okay. we end. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Franny or Nate, has there been any questions in the chat that we want to surface uh, uh, for, for our panelists? Um, yeah, there have actually. Um, and you've, you've already sort of touched on this idea of community, but um, Terry Elliott, um, wanted to know asked a question and then answered it as well but other people asked it um what does community mean exactly in so in terms of social reading um and terry's answer but yours might be different is that it, it extends to other networks this idea that it's not just the community in the margins but a larger community so uh, i was thinking of when you were talking about linking to, you know adding a link to go somewhere else out onto the web but can you talk about that a little bit well I'll follow up um and i think i can tie these two pieces together i'm hoping the community piece and then the linking um and i actually i'm glad franny you raised terry's question because i saw that earlier and i was like oh i want to clarify what i mean by building community 
And what I want to say is just based on my own experience using hypothesis to annotate as part of the um, marginal syllabus, for example, but one thing that I think is important to reflect on is if you're a student in a course and you don't know all the other students yet, or if you like are want to dive into annotation as part of like a, an organized experience on the web, like the marginal syllabus project, it's very, you're very vulnerable to like add a comment in the margin of a text and you don't really know who the people are who are going to see, to read your comment. Um, and so at first, like you have to almost get over that hump of fear, like, how is this, how are the readers of this text going to think about my annotation about my comment, but I have found related to building the community. Then when people start replying to your comment, it all it's the like really invigorating, I guess, and in, in like exciting that oh I like something that I that came to mind at this point in the reading also resonated something similar for someone else. So then I feel like that starts to build connections and links, I guess, between a group of people who find themselves in the margin of a text. And that from, if you can leverage that, um, I think that that can help build community around like shared interests, right? In a course, students are there, they might be there because they have to check the box. This is a gen ed course, but hoping to like um, use hypothesis as a way to, to um, surface people's interests um, that relate to the reading and then that relate to each other and then that maybe if people start replying to each other in the margin of the, of the text that that interaction is what starts to build community and connection between people. And then of course if you're linking out to other communities on the web that also helps strengthen and build networks. So that's what I wanted to say there. Yeah, that's great. And I want to kind of ask a follow up because there was another question about so in terms of that community, you know, we're building community, it's like a safe place and everything. So then how does assessment, how do things like assessment and grading figure into that, especially if it is a, you know, a required course. So it, those things can seem to be at odds. Mm -hmm. at, among the faculty that I've worked with who um, have used hypothesis in their courses, they don't tend to assign a grade like each annotation gets a grade. They view, they kind of position annotation or engagement in annotation as part of the participation grade overall. Like you're going to use, this tool is there for you to participate in these, in these discussions in this class. So it's, I've seen it been used as just an assessment, if you will, of students participation in a course. So I have, I, I think it's, I think the question was really well put because it depends on what your purposes are for using it. And I actually, um, Part of the reason I love hypothesis so much is the more that I've learned about teaching and learning and the more I've thought about my own teaching and what I really care about for my students, <laughs> the more I realize how central the outcome of learning how to read is. Um, it's the most important goal in my course, in any of my courses, is that they learn how to read and that they read in a certain way. They read in a certain way. Of course, that means I have to teach them how to read. And so in my courses now, learning how to read is the central outcome, which means that it's also the thing I assess. Uh, the most and do and I do it. I do specs grading and so I'm not doing it like eight ninety percent or whatever But I do have a rubric for how to raise certain kinds of questions about a text, etc And so I actually um, I don't want to overwhelm them because I do think it can serve a role for community as well But for me in my course, it's actually hypothesis can serve as an assessment tool um, And of course, there's lots of practicing that they do and I say okay Like so this is the way you ask the you, you notice this in the text, but maybe you want to notice something else here and here's another way you can ask the question differently or extend it or connect it to other things in the text so it um i think in special cases you can assess reading but i don't think it's like just assessing did you i mean i do have if it's in my participation grade it's like did you do some of them but typically what i did was as i said there would be four annotations that would be assessed throughout the semester and they knew in advance and then they would practice beforehand and I would give them feedback, but those four I would assess with a rubric. And so they would obviously put more time into reading and giving better annotations. Um, and, but it wasn't really community. They weren't communicating to each other necessarily. Um, although they did get credit for that, but for me it was really them engaging with the text, almost like the, a sort of, this could be a tool even if they couldn't see each other's annotations. I could use it that way too. Um, so yeah, so I think, I hope that gives you all some ideas of how assessment could work without it being so stifling <laughs> that they uh, they would stifle their um, communication, but it was still really important to me to do and that's why I did it.
I want to make one comment and then follow up with you, Betsy, about something you said. Um, you know, one thing I've thought about, I haven't thought this out uh, fully, but, you know, if, you know, you always see something like collaboration is like a 21st century skill, right? Or something like collaboration is something that we should be teaching students in, instead of the more sort of harder skills from previous sort of rubrics that have been designed for what, what student outcomes should be. Um, and I think if collaboration is a skill we're trying to teach and an outcome that we want to achieve, I've thought about this and I've never put it into practice, I haven't been in a classroom that like, how somebody is responding to classmates with their, with their, in a threaded conversation, right? How they are building on other people's ideas. Like the very idea, I, I, I hesitate to put, to make it, you know, uh, analytic to say like building community is something that can be assessed. Um, but community skills and collaboration skills may be something that can be assessed or at least uh, addressed, right? How a student is interacting with classmates, how they're building knowledge with classmates can be addressed through the visibility, as Christine has been saying, of, uh, of, of, of hypothesis and, and the way it makes reading and thinking visible. But Betsy, I want to follow up with a very specific thing that you said about reading, right? This is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and it's a little tangential perhaps, but I think, you know, talking about reading and introducing reading um, is, uh, is, you know, essential to college uh, uh, experience and so probably would resonate with your, with your um, instructors to, to frame it as, you know, reading being so vital. But, you know, just to, not to push back, but to hear a little more about it, like, your students are literate when they arrive at your course, right? And so what do you mean when you say teaching reading? They need to learn to read. What are some of those, you, know, you mentioned a rubric, which I'd love to see at some point, but like, you know, what does it mean to learn to read for your course, for your discipline, even though they probably know how to read in the kind of fundamental sense, there are other literacies they're developing. Right. Like, can you be more specific about that? Yeah, so I think, and it depends on discipline. So I, I noticed too, when I've taught, because my, my PhD is in religion, I do, but I'm an ethicist by training. So I really read like a philosopher. And so I can, I'm gonna look up some things that I can share with you too um, about participation in philosophy classes that can be helpful. But for me, it's um, really learning how to, how to read for argument and to see assumptions and to see connections between ideas. And so it's not just like I literally read the words, but what's, and, and in, in, in the literature class, it would be other things that you're seeing behind the words. In a philosophy class, it's understanding motivation for arguments. It's understanding the structure of a text. Um, so I, it's, it's really, and I mean, I, I sort of nerd out on this. <laughs> Maybe my students are like, oh, please no. But once they start to figure it out, they're like, oh, wow. And they can take that with them when they're reading a newspaper or what, and they can read other texts that aren't actually texts that also are arguments. So a podcast or something along those lines. It doesn't actually have to be a text text, um, but helping them learn how to, um, quote unquote, read for argument is really what I mean uh, along those lines. And I could say more about that, but I don't want to bore all your, yeah. all your watch, or those who are watching now. I'm just curious, when you do that though, when you, and, you, and you say reading for argument, do you have like, you know, three or four things underneath that that you would normally say, like, these are some different ways to read for argument. Like you said, assumption, like find assumption or find things like that. Yeah, so the first thing is that they can summarize an argument. So that actually, I think a lot of us just assume that that's the baseline and easy. They are terrible at that. I mean, and not they, we. We all are terrible at actually understanding somebody's argument and being able to summarize. So I don't actually think that's a low level skill if you're actually holding them accountable for really understanding the argument of what is being read. So that's one of my outcomes of my rubric is like, are you accurately understanding what reasons support what conclusions, et cetera? So, so here's what they say. Why do they say it? What are their reasons? That's like the, that's I think a first step is, so it's not just summarizing literally, I'm quoting what they said, but why do you, why did they say that? Which other part of the text actually supports this part of the text, et cetera. Um, and then uh, what's not said that supports that argument. And then also, and this is for me, part of reading is, do you agree or not? Do you agree with their argument? And so in my rubric, they actually have to in, they actually have to evaluate the text. Mm. So it's, all students are required to learn how to evaluate the text in the mar margins of their reading. So do you agree with this argument or not and why? You know, so being able to say why. And then another one I often have them do, because for me synthesis is really important just in their life skills is, how is what you've read here, whether you agree or disagree, related to something else in your life or something else you've read elsewhere? And so they have to bring in a quote, and that's the linkage, I think, that Christine was talking about. So those are the four very broad, when I do hypothesis rubrics, those four things. But certainly, if I were 
teaching like an intro critical thinking class or I taught intro writing before, it was very argument heavy. I spend much more time talking about the details of argument structure and, and doing assignments on, but on those lines. But I think broadly, if they do those four things, if they can get good at seeing arguments, seeing what's missing from the arguments, uh, being able to evaluate them well and connect it to other things that they've read, I am super happy that they have that's all that matters in my courses in many ways, if they can do those things. Well, if they can do those things, then I think we would probably have a different society. So I hope that, uh, <laughs> I hope that, that carries on beyond the classroom because that seems to be some of the essential problems in America right now that uh, you're attacking. Christine, you've also talked about framing this in terms of reading and showing a, that book, right? Do you want to mm -hmm. talk more about types of reading, different specific sorts of literacy? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't really, engage in like different types of reading when i show up the book it's really meant to be an exercise and like students might not be able to like have physical text in front of them to annotate right now but one thing that's been on my mind that maybe loops into some of the things we've been talking about earlier is actually when i'm doing my workshop i actually call attention to the practice of annotation and whether that is something that faculty members even talk about at the beginning of a class. Like I was thinking back to my own education and I don't know, like I can't remember actually ever being explicitly told, like I expect you to write on the margins of the text and to highlight. And this is the types of comments that you should be making in the margins of the text. So I've actually been starting to um, include that as a point of like reflection among the faculty in my workshops of like, do you even discuss annotation with your students? So like, regardless of the reading, like, do you talk to them about engaging? How should they be engaging with the reading that's in front of them, whether it's online or like printed out in front of them? So I think, I, I, yeah, I just, I mean, Jeremy, I'd be interested in your perspective as an English well, I, I mean, as anybody who's sitting on one of my webinars knows, I used to hand out Billy Collins' marginalia at the yeah, end of right. every class. So I made it pretty explicit, even though I didn't have the visibleness to it. But uh, there was something I want to follow up with you about. Uh, what, yeah, what's out of 10 faculty members that you've talked to, how many have made a practice in the past, do you think, of being explicit about? I mean, when, I, when I pitch that question to the group and I'm like looking at their Zoom videos, I do feel like they're pausing and like, like, like they're put on their thinking face, like, oh. So I, I don't exactly know, but just judging their reactions on the Zoom screen, I feel like it is something that they might not actually do in their classes. Um, so I've just been trying to like, I don't know, again, like go back to basics, if you will. Like what, what, what is it that we expect our students to be annotating in the margins? of a text, like what, what kinds of thoughts would be there? And again, this is where I talk about, well, we want them to make connections. Like this chapter reminded me of what we talked about in class last week, you know, or this chapter reminded me of the front page of an article in the New York Times today. So like just being, a, so, so yeah, so I just, I really go back to talking about like, what does it mean for students in your course to be annotating? Like what, what kinds of thing, what kinds of thoughts do you want them to be having in, as they're doing the reading, and then how can they make that explicit and visible to you and to each other? There is, um, I'm sorry, I've been like scrambling, like trying to find, I'm gonna post a bunch of links in the chat just in a second, but um, I think there are some disciplinary resources out there that for if you're talking with, spe specifically in the humanities, of course, and not necessarily in others, but on how to read for history. One of my friends from Rice, Caleb McDaniel, has a nice uh, blog post on how to read for history. There are a couple of things in how to read for philosophy that colleagues have done. And actually, um, one of the things I'm gonna share is not about reading, it was from earlier, but about how can I participate? And it's like, a hundred ways in which a student can participate in a conversation in a philosophy class and it, it totally applies to um, when you're when you're reading uh, and, and annotating an hypothesis but I, there's also this like old 1950s book that is so outdated and terrible but I still love it uh, by Mortimer Adler called How to Read a Book um, and it has and it just sort of it's just this lovely thing that to me as a nerd who loves thinking about reading that I even had my students read sections of like this is really important there are different ways of reading and you're going to in different disciplines they're going to expect you to read differently and you know in a philosophy class i may ask you to read two pages but to spend two hours on those two pages in a history you're going to read 300 pages in half an hour and how do they they don't they don't they've never been taught that so hypothesis can be a real tool to help them learn those disciplinary differences of reading as well it's just so exciting and i think 
getting faculty to realize this is a potential for them to make their reading better, which is what they often complain about is the students aren't reading well. And so if they're not doing it with something well, maybe we should teach them how to do it, do it better, right? Um, so I'll, I'll post some of these links in here that you, got, you all can look at, but I just wanted to say that too. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I would I'd love to, to read those how to reads. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about that and talking a lot about that with the faculty I'm talking to. I'm imagining that it's about time for us to wrap up and respect people's time to move on with the rest of the day. I have to admit, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of the day because this is such a wonderful conversation. It kind of can't be beat. I'm just going to go back to something far less interesting um, uh, for the rest of my uh, afternoon. But I have enjoyed this thoroughly. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm, I'm really thankful uh, for both you guys sharing your ideas. Um, and I just, you know, hang in there. Um, you're doing great work. Um, and, you know, be well. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone. And I, I did have a, uh, another question. It was actually my own, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Like, maybe as an exercise, people could have students when they're at home, if they actually have any hard copy books at home, um, they could pick one up and start to annotate it in it and see what the difference is between doing that alone in a vacuum and then coming back and doing that in the community online so just an idea um but yes thank you this was an amazing show uh